So for those of you who don't know me, I'm Catherine. I'm the History and Philosophy of Science Undergraduate Society's president. Um, and uh, yeah, we've been working for this event, so I'm glad that it's happening finally. Um, yeah, so uh, just before we start, I'd like to thank the Institute for the History of Philosophy of Science and Technology, <laughs> from now on known as the Institute, uh, for providing us with yummy snacks and for their ongoing support <laughs> and uh, yeah, just general joy. Um, <laughs> and um, also, um, I'd like to solemnly acknowledge the land on which this University of Toronto operates. Thousands of years and has been the traditional land of the Huron Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, this meeting place is home to many Indigenous people from across the Central <coughs> Island, and we are grateful for the opportunity to work on this land. Um, so, I will do a quick, brief introductory comment for each of the people in case you don't know them personally. <laughs> um, so, we will start. Uh, <laughs> I have the order here wrong, so you can read in the <laughs> name tags as we go along. So, uh, Professor Steinberg, over here, <laughs> um, is uh, the pr Professor of Physics here at the University of Toronto, co-director of the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research Program for Quantum Information Science. Um, interestingly, his 2011 experiment, met, which measured average trajectories for photons in the two slip. Now get me, interferometer, interferometer, Perfect. <laughs> um, was selected for the Physics uh, World Magazine Breakthrough of the Year. Um, so he's a founding member of the Center for Quantum Information and Quantum Control. Um, and uh, yeah, he is a fantastic person to have on the panel, as obvious by his CV. And uh, we're really excited to have you. Thank you. <laughs> um, then we have Professor Miller sat here. <laughs> um, he is assistant professor at the Department of Philosophy and like the Institute here. Um, and uh, he studies physics and philosophy, foundations of physics, um, and he physics and philosophy and foundation of physics at Chicago and Columbia before completing his PhD <coughs> in the history and philosophy of science at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, his research is focused on reconceptualizing how mathematics how mathematics functions as a language for describing empirical phenomena. By understanding mathematical deficiencies in scientific theories as clues on how the theory represents the world, <coughs> Professor Miller has argued that breakdowns of mathematical consistency that arise in the course of scientific theorizing often are the best sources of information about how mathematical structures capture the physical meaning. And he's public, published, I published um, on these themes, um, and specifically with fundamental particle physics. So, we have a great person to discuss the philosophy of what we're doing. Uh, Professor Berkowitz, down in the middle over there. <laughs> uh, he's Associate Professor and Director of Undergraduate Studies here at the Institute. Um, his research interests are the philosophy of physics, part, particularly the philosophy of probability. Um, he has analyzed the nature of causality, probabilities, and properties in quantum realms and randomness in chaos in the classical realm. Um, if that wasn't enough, uh, he's also an expert in philosophy of economics, and his research has pertained to rational decision theory, the conceptual foundations of economics, and the relations between economics and political philosophy. Um, his contrib contributions to the event have extended beyond just his exciting contributions he'll have to the discussion, but he also managed to get us funding for our event. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Professor Yang sat to his left. Um, is the Associate Professor and the Director of the Institute. Um, his research areas the history of physics and the history of technology from the late 19th century to the present. Um, he has published on how science and engineering have shaped each other at the levels of mathematical structures, physical theories, experimentation, instrumentation, and the development of new technologies. He currently has six pro projects on the go, but most relevantly, he is doing the very recent history of quantum information uh, so we're very excited to have him here to contribute for a historical insight onto our discussion. And uh, Professor Syke, we have here. <laughs> and uh, so we, it's a wide-ranging research institute. You've had amazingly in intricate, detailed things on your websites, which I could understand none. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> as, but as far as I can understand, uh, theoretical condensed matter physics, quantum optics, nonlinear quantum optics, and topics related to the foundations of quantum mechanics. 
Uh, so hopefully he will say things that I will understand a bit better <laughs> than his website. <laughs> um, so yeah, and he's very known for his charismatic teaching. So we're excited for that. <laughs> um, so before we start with the discussion, which will be led by Patrick, who is our vice president of the society, um, we will turn it over to Aaron Penner, who, although he said he's not an expert in the field, his PhD is on the philosophy of probability, quantifying uncertainty in science, particularly with climate science. Uh, as a non-expert in quantum mechanics, he's perfectly suited for those of us who don't understand quantum mechanics to give us a brief like, overview of the fundamentals of it. So, Aaron Penny. Thank you. <laughs> Um, thank you, everyone, and thank you for the request. Um, I was a bit apprehensive in accepting it. I think the idea was, well, you know something about probability, and don't they use probability in quantum mechanics? And so, therefore, you should uh, give intelligent commentary on it. Um, I can't promise intelligent commentary, but I think um, I know enough, or at least I know what you guys know, to hope, hopefully point you guys into the right direction when these intelligent gentlemen um, start talking over our heads. Okay. Um, so the uh, what I want to do is just give a brief outline of the Newtonian promise right, to understand the world in a deterministic, um, completely uh, known way. This is, I mean, how much of that was actually an accurate representation of Newtonianism is we could debate, um, but this is the um, this is the, the running line. Um, okay, so um, long story short, at the end of the 19th century, um, we had gentlemen like Lord Kelvin who said, we know everything, right? There's not much to know. Uh, all we need to do is calculate a little bit more to set our initial conditions, and then we can just calculate and predict with uh, complete um, certainty. Right? So whether it's planets or billiard balls or perhaps even the operation of um, thermodynamical states, we can, uh, we can make these kind of precise predictions. Um, and think of it, uh, a clear example would be the, the operation of billiard balls, right? So if I have a billiard ball and I toss it against the wall really hard, at any moment, given the initial conditions and the, <laughs> the dynamical equation that Newton um, gave us and Newtonian development gave us, we should be able to calculate its trajectory and its speed um, at any moment with certainty. Right? So if we know its initial conditions, uh, we know its, its final state. And this is the idea. Um, well, in the uh, early 20th century, actually in the late 19th century, very end of the 19th century, some phenomena started to arise that, that placed this framework in a bit of question. Um, specifically, we had phenomena like um, black body radiation, and ultraviolet catastrophe. Who, who here has heard of the ultraviolet catastrophe? Everyone. Um, I'm not going to explain those, but it was a catastrophe. <laughs> <laughs> and thermodynamicists made predictions that just uh, were not being observed in experimental um, situations. So something was wrong. Then we had other phenomena like the photoelectric effect. Again, can all right, which, which demonstrated conclusively the uh, particle-like behavior of, of light, right? Um, well, up until that time, of course, uh, the, the prevailing view is that light was a wave, okay? So we did wave, white light demonstrated wave-like properties. Right? Think of uh, Thomas Young's double slit experiment. And, 1820s, early 19th century, um, where if you fire light through a double slit, right, so you have the wall back there, you have a light source, um, and you can attenuate it enough where you fire it through one slit that's open, and you just get this, this beam of light um, uh, making a nice uniform display on the, on the wall. Now, if you open up two slits, what you end up seeing is an is interference pattern. Is what is an interference pattern? Think of, you had one slit, you get this kind of area of light, right? So that's the, the light traveling through the slit and impinging upon the screen and it's recorded. Then when you open up two slits, then what you get is something like this. 
after after sufficient statistics are built up. <coughs> so you get these periods of light, and then you get these dark spots. Light patches in here as well. So I had this interference pattern. Yeah. The idea then was, well, light is a wave, and so when you open up these two slits, if light is a wave traveling through a, a medium, and what's going, the wave is going to start interacting with itself. Right? So the wave is going to pass through the slits, and you're going to have peaks and crop canceling each other out, sometimes peaks amplifying each other. And where they amplify, they create these bright spots. Where they cancel each other out, they create these dark spots. And sometimes you get um, hinges here, um, but uh, you see these concentrations. And you can, you can work this out in terms of probabilities too. Uh, 31. 33% of, of the impact is here, 7% is here, and then you get a distribution. So you, here you have, as a well-established in the late 19th century, early 20th century, a well-established foundation that light is a wave, but then you have something like the photoelectric effect, where light is being construed in this quantized fashion, these little packets of energy. And then you had other historic, uh, experimental phenomena, too. Um, uh, spectral lines in the, when you look at um, certain atoms <coughs> that are being heated, they give certain patterns, right? and you get these crisp cutoffs. You have uh, uh, a certain uh, type of light impingement here, and then you have a, a, a dark um, recess here, and then another. And so um, you have these phenomena which give um, the impression that light is a, par a particle. Um, but also you have uh, experimental phenomena which give it wave-like properties. Um, and so the question then was, um, well, how about something like an electron? Right? Um, and this brings us, <coughs> skipping all of a bunch of history, to the 1920s. Uh, so from a series of experiments from 1923 to 1927 at Bell Labs in the United States, um, the professors here will correct me if I'm wrong, but the two gentlemen, Davison and Germer, um, conducted these experiments. And what they, they did is then take um, a single electron and then fire it through a slit. Right? So if you have one slit, again, what you see is this uniform uh, pattern on this. So it's a, this screen, I, I don't know the exact material properties, but it re registers the, the, uh, um, the electrical interactions and it gives off a light. And, well, then they opened up two screens, or two slips. Maybe. And then, again, what they saw is the interference pattern. So here, electrons are supposed to be these point masses, right? They have charges. They behave in certain ways. In fact, you can, you can track them in cloud chambers. And now, I don't, I don't think the cloud chamber was in, invented until the 1930s, I believe. Um, but there are other reasons that uh, physicists have for believing that light or excuse me, electron was, was a part of it. And so what is this interference pattern? What's, what's going on here? So what we have, mind you, um, perhaps I, I should have articulated this better before, but you have one electron, right? So you have one electron coming from a, a source. You open up two uh, slits and you get the electron presenting itself in the interference pattern. And as you build this up, so you fire more and more electrons, you start getting these clearly delineated Patterns. So the idea is then what is going on? Right? Um, and then uh, let's have somebody by the name of Erwin Schrodinger. I think everyone heard of Schrodinger's cat, right? Yeah, it's, that's that Schrodinger. And he had this idea as well, let's understand. Um, I have I can I can create an equation um, that can predict the distribution uh, of energies that this electron can have. And we can think of an electron as being kind of squished out right? and, and in, in this wave like um, um, property and then interacting with itself. Fast forward, then a little bit, <coughs> Born comes out and says, well, listen, it's not that the electron itself is being squished out, but what you have, you have a, what we call, what we can call the superposition principle, right? We have a distribution of probabilities, right? So this wave function, which is actually a deterministic wave function, the Schrodinger, Schrodinger equation, which is actually a deterministic equation, it tells you 
how the energies of this system um, uh, evolve as the system evolves. And Born came out and probabilized it, right? And gave um, the mathematics which allows us to understand this and probably amplify it. And what does that do? Well, it tells you this wave, this supervision, right? It's a description of the state, um, but the state is in terms of probabilities. So the electron is not in any one position at any one time. And it, 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 and inhabits a, a, a grand um, a spread of possibilities. And these possibilities are represented in terms of probabilities. And these probabilities, when you uh, perform uh, the appropriate number of experiments, you build up the appropriate number of statistics, and it predicts this uh, interference pattern with tremendous accuracy. And so then you get this idea of how to interpret this wrong. So how to interpret notions like a superposition? What does it mean? to say that this electron um, enjoys a superposition, right, that has these probabilities of being observed under um, certain conditions, right? So when it impinges upon the screen, that's an observation. But here's a really wonky thing, right? So you open up double slits, you fire the electron, right? And you just look at the screen, you build up this interference pattern. But what if you track the electron, you follow it? What do you guys think happens? Take a wild, Yes. <laughs> Do you think interference pattern goes away? Yep, it goes away. So if you track the electron, falling through, it seems that the electron then decides then not to interact with itself, and it follows um, um, a pretty known um, uh, trajectory to the back of the screen. Right? So you get that. But if you decide to stop looking at the electron, then it decides to start interacting with itself. Right? So this is weird stuff. Luckily, we have uh, professors and experts up here to, to make it, to tell us it's not weird anymore. <laughs> you can explain everything. All right. So, um, good. good. Um, so this presents us the end up. The, so this presents us with a number of concepts: uncertainty, probability, the way probability um, uh, uh, plays a part in these quantum phenomena, um, the nature of observation, the nature of the observer. Um, and other notions that um, we'll, uh, that we'll hear um, have a definite historical um, backing for it. And um, so if you guys are interested, look it up. Um, it's pretty fun stuff. Okay, so I'm going to turn it over to Patrick now. We're going to have a discussion for probably about an hour-ish, 50 minutes, um, and then we will have a short break, and at that point, if you have any questions, I'll come back and remind. But if you have any questions, just let me know, and I'll put your name down so that when we come to asking questions to our expert panel, it will be a little bit more organized. <laughs> okay, yes, Patrick, you good? Excellent, yes. Thank you, everybody, for uh, attending, and thank you, panelists, for also attending. Um, so before we get going, it might be beneficial for, for the panelists just to get a show of hands for who's actually familiar with the quantum mechanical formalism. So who's actually seen quantum mechanics in terms of linear algebra <laughs> at any point in there? Okay, so this half of the room. Start up. Great, yeah. <laughs> Very improbable. Anyways, um, so one of the things that Aaron was mentioning is how uh, he, he started by talking about that transition from classical physics, where it seemed as though everything was totally deterministic uh, if we have the right initial conditions, we can compute exactly the outcomes and exactly how the universe ought to behave. And then he started <coughs> talking about how in quantum mechanics, things have switched to being more probabilistic. And so rather than dealing with certainties, we deal with probabilities of different outcomes. So the first question <coughs> that I understand is a very loaded question, which perhaps would be best to direct towards Professor Berkowitz initially, is what is the how should we interpret these probabilities and, and do they actually give us a deterministic description of the world or is quantum mechanics an indeterministic theory suddenly? How, how do we understand that? I suppose it depends. <laughs> <laughs> What's the probability? That yeah. It's probabilistic? Um, so there is a mainstream theory of quantum mechanics and this mainstream theory many, many times is understood as not deterministic. Um, uh, but there are many interpretations of quantum mechanics and there are attempts of alternative theories that uh, are supposed to give the same predictions 
and they vary. I mean, some of them are deterministic and some of them are indeterministic. Um, as for the probability, there is also a um, variety of different interpretation. Um, it's very tempting to think about probability as objective, meaning that it's a property of the objects. Um, you know, they, um, either that they have a certain disposition, but maybe not a deterministic disposition, um, or that there is a certain uh, uh, frequency of their properties that is that we see. Uh, but there is also subjective probability, and uh, um, and it's becoming more and more popular. And the subjective probability many times is associated with quantum information, and more the idea that quantum mechanics is not describing the world for us, but it's actually <coughs> describing the information that we can have about the world and the uncertainty that we have about the world. So to that extent, I mean, the probability could be just more reflection of what we can know <coughs> about the world and, and how should we change our mind when we have new information. Um, so in short, I mean, it, it really depends. I mean, there are all these kind of interpretation. The subjective interpretation was considered bad, I suppose, at some point. And uh, um, like, for instance, Karl Popper, if you heard about him, uh, he thought that uh, Bohr was subjectivist and he was bad. I mean, so it's like <coughs> not following, I mean, his interpretation. Um, but nowadays, I mean, people are much more open to think about probability as subjective. And subjective probability is also used in other parts of physics <coughs> and in other parts of science. So the idea is more to understand what a theory says, uh, what's the meaning of a theory. The theory can be understood as reflecting properties in the world or more reflecting information or more as an instrument that allows us to, uh, to predict things in the world, even if it doesn't say uh, directly anything about the way the world is, or at least, I mean, not all the thing about the way the world is. So you seem to be hinting at sort of a, an informational interpretation of quantum mechanics then and talking about the constituent elements of the world effectively just being information. So to what end do you actually think that that's a, a, an adequate representation of the world? Um, actually, my, my interest in quantum mechanics started from probability. I, I had a teacher who taught uh, philosophy of probability and he was expert. Uh, Itamar Pitovsky was an expert on uh, quantum logic and, and quantum probability. Um, and uh, he asked the question whether one can apply subjective probability um, a while ago, long while ago, before it was actually common to use it. And uh, the way I took it and, and the way that I, it influenced me is that I looked at some subjectivist <coughs> interpretation that looks at quantum mechanics as more instrument. So it's, it's, not a, it's, it's not even necessarily connected directly to information. It's more connected to what is rational, uh, what degree of expectation one should have. And these degrees of expectation are subjective, but obviously they are informed by objective facts. But they're not really uh, re reflecting the way the world is. They are just reflecting the best instrument about the world. If you want it, they're kind of oracle. Uh, they tell you what's the best way to bet on the next event or something like that. So I, I thought more about probability as a long instrumentalist line, but one can think about information as the basic uh, concept and then think about information as maybe something that is less instrumental and, and just think about it uh, uh, and just uh, think about the theory as telling you the kind of information that you can obtain uh, and the kind of information that you cannot obtain about the physical world. And if I Absolutely. jump in here, because I, I'm very interested in what you have to say about these different kinds of probability. <clears throat> but I'm concerned that we, we might have jumped over some background material about how this fits into quantum mechanics more broadly. And I, I want to provide at least my perspective on that. When Yossi says that there are different interpretations of quantum mechanics, I think we have to recognize that there are <clears throat> at least two different parts of quantum mechanics. And there's a part that we understand perfectly. We know exactly what this theory is. And there's a part that we really don't understand and we argue about and there's philosophical dispute. The first part, the part that we understand where we can write down the equation and we know how to solve it, there is nothing <laughs> probabilistic in that. That is a completely deterministic set of laws for how the universe evolves. The problem with it 
is that in classical physics, when we said, if I knew the state now, I could predict the state in the future, what we meant by the state was where is everything in the universe and how fast is it moving? Where is the sun, where's the earth, where's Mars, and, and so on. And if we wanna make the same argument for that quantum law, we have to change our entire view of what it means to describe the state of the universe. What is this state that we're propagating into the future? And one way of describing it would be to say, think about this classical description of the world, all the different ways a classical world could be, and assign to every single one of them something that looks like a probability. All right, that, that's an oversimplification. Mathematically, it's more complicated, but something kind of like a probability. And if you do that, and that's what you mean by the quantum state, we know exactly what to do with it, and it's completely deterministic. The problem, then, is, as you said, comes down to how do we interpret these things? What, what is this probabilistic state where we have some probability amplitude for a dead cat and some probability amplitude for a live cat? Some people who really want to take the formalism as the be-all, end-all of, of the universe would say that really is the state of the universe. This is an objective description of how the universe is. And many other people, including both the founders of quantum mechanics and these more modern people from the information perspective, would like to say, no, 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 those are telling us something about how much we can know, not about the actual state. So there's a lot to ask about how we should go from this abstract description of the world to what you and I observe and what these probabilities mean. But there is always this option just to stick with the part of the theory we actually do know. And there's no uncertainty in that part. There's no indeterminism in, in that part. Well, it depends a little bit on what you mean by the theory we know. I mean, <laughs> the one way to think about the theory we know would be the usual thing about propagation, Schrodinger's equation, and then measurement with some sort of probabilities for the results. That's what we teach our students. Mm -hmm. And that, it, it, in that sort of body of, 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 of <clears throat> you know, sort of that way of thinking about things, there is indeterminism. It occurs sometimes. There's determinism between measurements, but there's indeterminism when you make a measurement. And then there are issues of how you define that and talk about that. But mm -hmm. if one thinks of that as textbook quantum mechanics, then indeed there's elements of both determinism and indeterminism in it. I'd like to maybe just mention a bit on the subjective and, and uh, objective probabilities, because I, I, I just offer you what I think is a good example of a way to think about the, the two different perspectives. Think about a situation where you have two physicists and they, they, they both make a calculation of exactly the same situation. You would normally say they should get the same result for some outcome. And one predicts a probability of 50% and one predicts a probability of 30%. Now, if you believe in objective probabilities, <clears throat> then one is right and one is wrong. Or they could both be wrong. If you believe, yeah. or they could both be wrong, <laughs> of course. Okay. If you believe in subjective probabilities, they could both be right, as long as those probabilities correctly reflected what they thought about a coming experiment. It's just that one would be a better physicist than the other. <laughs> okay. But they could both be right in the sense that the probabilities captured their beliefs about what was going to, you know, what was going to happen next. So there are those two different views. Um, to bring information into the, into the discussion uh, is very fashionable these days. Uh, and, and often, you know, sort of, you know, sort of brings in some interesting insights. But... It, it's certainly important, I think, to remember that when we talk about information, at least colloquially, it refers to information about something. And the question for interpretational strategies for quantum mechanics or any other scientific discipline, I think, is, is not that there's information about something. Of course, there's information about something. The question is, what is the something? Is that information about the state of the universe? Is that information about what we think is going to happen next? Okay. Uh, those are two different views, and you can find a number of other ones as well. They both involve information, but it doesn't seem to me that 
the introduction of the term information by itself adds any clarity to the discussion. I, I appreciate the fact that quantum mechanics offers a lot to what you can do with information process, and that's very exciting research. But I'm not sure that just the introduction of the term information into the discussion actually helps. I agree. I mean, that's the reason why I said that there is a different subjective interpretation, which is the instrumental. Now, John is right that, uh, in principle, those who follow the subjective probability, they can have different probabilities to scientists. But remember that it's an instrumental interpretation. Instrumental means that it has to be successful. And to be successful, one has to think very hard about the probability that one uses as a tool. It's like, you know, you want to use a, a, a bicycle, I mean, to go up the Everest and, you know, or something else. I mean, it's not the best instrument. So, uh, although it's possible, I mean, to use it or to try to use it, um, it it's not a good idea. So I think that uh, instrumentally means, in my view, the subjectivist would get the same number as the objectivist, but they will have a different interpretation of it. The interpretation would be that this is just a tool for prediction. They don't deny that the world, I mean, if, it's, if, if one interprets quantum mechanics as an instrument, one doesn't deny that there is something going on there. But one, one is more agnostic about, one, doesn't, one argues that the theory itself doesn't tell you the way the world is, it tells you more how to have good predictions and how to build good technology. Um, so this is a different interpretation. And uh, there are good arguments on both sides. Uh, one of the things about uh, uh, the instrumental interpretation is that it's really difficult to think about quantum mechanics as a theory that tells you uh, the way the things are in the world uh, without getting into a serious trouble. Um, so I think that... Uh, and, and there are things like, for instance, that related to measurement, for instance, in the mainstream interpretation of quantum mechanics that are clearly seems to be instrumental, that nobody takes them seriously as describing something in the world. So, uh, but that doesn't mean that one should give up, I mean, the attempt to try to interpret or to come up with interpretation of quantum mechanics or alternative theory that describe the world. The problem is that although I said there are many interpretations, maybe 20, 30 many interpretations, uh, they all have problems. And that's the challenge. That's why it's very interesting to still ask this question because all of them, in one way or another, are problematic. Yep. Uh, maybe, I'm sorry, I don't want to yeah. monopolize, but let me, I, I agree, let me follow up, try to follow up on that. Suppose you believe that you want to construct something like the Newton, the Newtonian paradigm, something where your, the abstract elements in your theory, the you know, variables you introduce and so on, actually refer to what's going on in the world. They really do talk about what's going on. And, you're, and you're, you're willing to be open about that. You're willing to say, well, I could believe there's some fundamental indeterminism that's really there. That wouldn't bother me. And I'm willing to have all kinds of weirdness and, and so on. But I really want my equations to describe what's going on in the world. The same way that we, in our first year physics course, we thought when we were solving the equations for blocks sliding down inclined planes, we really thought we were talking about blocks sliding down inclined planes. Okay? If you really want to do that, if you take the laws of the, 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 the equations of quantum mechanics, you really want to do that, you can. There's a number of ways to do it, in fact, as Josie said. Okay? I, it seems to me that the fundamental problem with that the situation is that all of them force you to accept a universe which in one way or another seems to be very conspiratorial. It seems as if it's built in such a way as to give you problems, that the creator was very sadistic in planning how nature was going to work because his creatures would be totally flummoxed by <clears throat> sort of picturing it. Okay? That doesn't, but you can build the descriptions and they're fine. Okay? 
<coughs> but you have to deal with this conspiratorial <coughs> aspect that comes up. <clears throat> Many of you have heard about bells and equalities and, and superluminal this and that and so on. And it's these kinds of conspiratorial things. Things are happening faster than the speed of light, but there's no way that you can measure them. Or, 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 or see evidence for them in a case-by-case -case basis. Now, the most likely way out of the situation is just to say quantum mechanics is wrong. I mean, it's the best theory we have at the moment, but it's almost assuredly wrong. I mean, every other theory, classical mechanics, Aristotelian physics, you know, we more or less understand that that's wrong. There were bits and pieces of it that were right, but, you know, it's fundamentally wrong. I mean, to think, if you really think now that quantum mechanics, that are our current theory, very successful, but if you really think that that's the final theory humankind is ever going to have, well, for that kind of hubris, the ancients were struck down by the gods. I mean, you should not allow yourself to think that way, all right? Almost assuredly, the theory is wrong. The problem is, when you get into these interpretational issues, you even if it's wrong, if you believe the experimental data, it seems to be you're going to get into these, it's, the, the universe is going to be completely conspiratorial. If you have the kind of description of it that somebody, uh, 19th century physicist would like. Yeah, sorry, I said too much. Excellent. <laughs> If anyone else doesn't have something that they want to say, then uh, something that was mentioned a lot there was uh, the notion of measurement. And whenever people try to teach quantum mechanics, they, they generally start by introducing you to thought experiments and telling you how certain measurements uh, would yield certain results. Um, but that leads itself to a very natural question that to the classical physicist was easy to answer, but to the modern physicist is very challenging to answer, which is what do we mean when we say measurement? Now, I'll perhaps direct this first towards you, yeah. Professor Steinberg, given your work with quantum measurement. Because we do measurements. <laughs> <laughs> measurements and, and, and things of that nature. But. <laughs> I, I'm the only experimentalist on the panel, so I, I, I guess it's fair. Thank you, Dan. Um, I, I think I'm going to take a slightly different approach to answering your question, which is a great question. And for those of you who had, don't already know this or haven't figured it out, the back and forth that John and I already had was exactly over this issue. If you don't ask what the results of observations or measurements are, that's when you get the simple part of the theory that I said we already understand. Mm -hmm. But as soon as you ask, what do we actually see when we observe something, we do a measurement, mm -hmm. that's when life gets complicated. And there's an extreme, I don't even want to say way out of this, an extreme way of refusing to answer that question that on some days appeals to me and some days doesn't. But just to be provocative, I'm going to offer you that one for now, which is to say that the, the ways we try to treat it, this thing that you didn't use the word, but this thing that we often call collapse that occurs when a measurement occurs, um, you never need to use that in the treatment of an experiment, of the evolution of a physical system, until you ask, what do I actually see at the end? In other words, when you get to the level of discussing what happens with some observer. And the extreme approach to this is to say, that means what we don't understand is not the laws of physics, but our conscious experience of their results. And at that point, sometimes I'm ready to say, you're just reminding me that we don't understand consciousness at all. It's not the job of physicists, at least not in the early 21st century, to resolve that question. I can be agnostic and say, you're right. I don't understand the origin of our conscious experience of the world. Why my mathematical description is this funny superposition, this wave function, whatever that means. And yet my experience is these concrete people in concrete positions and stars and planets and all the rest of it. So it's possible to just refuse to answer the question. Um, <laughs> the reason I bring up the possibility is because the short answer to your question is we have no idea. There is no strict definition of what constitutes a measurement if you want to say we have a second physical law that only comes into play when a measurement occurs. The classical physicists in 1926 
did that because, as you alluded to, the boundary between the quantum world and what we did in everyday life was so huge that there were simply miles and miles and miles of room to fit that measurement in anywhere. There are still miles and miles and miles of room between our quantum experiments and, and our experience. And I think John already mentioned this as well. It is completely possible and easily conceivable that there is simply some law of physics that we do not know about yet, that somewhere between atoms and molecules and semiconductors and my brain interpolates itself and causes the world to start appearing classical. That would be a theory beyond the current theory of quantum mechanics. Mm -hmm. And that would be great. People look for evidence for it. But we don't have that evidence yet. We can speculate about what it might look like. We can do experiments to test those speculations. But otherwise, all the experiments we've been able to do so far in controlled situations, up until the moment when we observe them, can be understood without any such hypothesis. But we, of course, do also have other quantum interpretations like Girardi and some other people who include no collapse uh, mm -hmm. systems. So, for, I, yeah. I, I just wanted to say that actually measurement is a misnomer. If you think about uh, I think we have a general idea of what measurement is in classical physics. So you have a battery, for instance, and, and you want to measure the, the charge of the battery or the voltage. Um, so the assumption is that you take a voltmeter, voltmeter and you correlate the property that exists before the measurements with what you see on the dial. And in good measurements, I mean, the correlation would be good. I mean, we'll just reflect. So that's basically measurement. Something that exists before the measurements, the, the, the property that one wants to measure. And then in order to know what it is, we correlate it to something that we can see. You know, whether it's a dial of a, a voltmeter or printout of a computer. In quantum mechanics, is is very different. You can have a situation in which the electron, is, as Aaron uh, mentioned, is it could be here or it could be there. But it could be in a situation that it's in a superposition of being here and there, which means that it's neither here nor there. Now you measure the position, we know that you will find it always either here or there. But we don't actually measure, so when we say that we measure position, we don't really do the same thing as in classical physics because the, the particle doesn't have a position before the measurements. We basically, it's more like we, we force the particle to end up in one way or another. So it's the whole notion of measurement is, is kind of strange, I would say. Um, and it's not, isn't it? Well, I was going to ask you, if you believed in yeah. objective probabilities, yeah. even in the classical world, wouldn't you reach the same problem? Wouldn't you say, I can have uh, a probability distribution for where a car is at this moment, and when I observe it, I find it in one place or another. There was an 80% chance of rain this afternoon. I observed it. It did rain, but it could have not rained. The observation of the event is not observation of the probability. Objective probability is observed indirectly. For instance, I take the same type, for instance, I take a coin, and I know that it could land on heads and tails, and it's 50-50% and it's objective probability. By tossing the coin and seeing heads or tails, it doesn't tell me anything about the objective probability. It's not a measurement of it. If I toss it many times and they are independent, I'm lucky. I'm not unlucky, let's say. Um, the frequency of this event, like 50% heads and 50% tails, would be a measurement of this, indirect measurement of this. So I think it's different. No, but I, I don't mean to measure the probability. I, I mean, we, we measure whether the coin is heads or tails, mm -hmm. and that wasn't a property beforehand. The property was just a probability. When I make the measurement, it chooses to be heads or tails. But there is no, no place in, except for quantum mechanics in which you will have this situation. I mean, the coin, think about the coin, I mean, as a quantum system. Uh, it's, it has position all the time. Um, so if, if the heads, I mean, you know, the, 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 the evolution of, of the coin, I mean, from a certain initial conditions of position to the end, uh, 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 one or another, it's, the coin always had a position. In quantum mechanics, you have to pretend that the coin doesn't have a position. It has this objective probability. You toss it, and suddenly you get a position. Now, it's an interesting process, but it's not a measurement in the, in the classical sense because you don't measure something that exists before. You create. It's a more a preparation, I, I would say, or, or, or forcing the, the system 
to have a state at the end. So it, already there, there is a big problem, I think, in quantum mechanics, if you take superposition seriously. Maybe. Just yeah. just to follow up on that, I, sorry, I keep following up. I hope this is okay. Are we, are we allowed? <laughs> so it's I, I, regardless of your interpretational stance in quantum mechanics, when you're talking about just doing quantum mechanics in the lab or writing down theories, it's useful to talk in a slightly different way than one normally does in classical mechanics. And as, as you said, in classical mechanics, you might talk about something, you might talk about the measurement of position of a particle. In quantum mechanics, you should talk about a position measurement. Position becomes an adjective. It's a kind of measurement. It's a kind of task you do in the laboratory. And it gives certain results for which you can predict probabilities. How those are connected to what the thing you think you're measuring is really doing if there is such a thing and as if it even if it even makes sense to talk that way that depends on the different probability stances you take but it, you can save yourself a lot of grief in quantum mechanics in talking about position measurements rather than talking about measurements of the position you look like you had something you wanted to say somewhere along the line there Oh no, I agree. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I agree. Uh, so I don't. So I don't know that that's a, that that's fully interpretation independent. So there there exists interpretations on which it, it's perfectly sensible to talk about uh, position measures. Yeah, but I, I was thinking about a, a, a physicist just trying to earn their job in the lab and not confuse yeah, themselves yeah. and yeah. not get into fights with their colleagues. It's a safe ground. Then there are other questions you can ask follow. But if, it's, if, but if one's committed to Bohmian mechanics, for example, then it makes perfect sense That's to consider yes, of a measurement of position because there are facts <laughs> Within a given interpretation. Yeah. Yeah. So just, I mean, Bohmian mechanics is the deterministic quantum mechanics that in which the particle always have positions. But you pay the price elsewhere. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah, it's funny. I would have said the many worlds theory is deterministic quantum mechanics, and Bohmian exactly. mechanics is something beyond That's deterministic right. quantum mechanics. <laughs> anyway. So a lot of what you guys were alluding to is whether or not we're able to prescribe properties to entities at any given time. And that's a, a standard problem with interpreting the, the degree of realism of quantum mechanics. And I'd be interested in understanding where each of you sits on that spectrum. So, so do you actually, if, so for instance, Professor Steinberg, if you're in the lab and you are actually doing an experiment with photons and you prepare them here and then you measure them over here, do you actually think that they exist in between and that, or sorry, that they have proper, that their properties are well-defined in between? The answer to the first question is, is yes. I think it's, mm -hmm. it's not impossible, but it's very difficult to be an experimentalist and not to be a realist. Right. Um, I, I honestly don't even understand non-experimentalists who aren't realists, but I gather they exist. Um, <laughs> your next question was a little thornier because, yes, I, I personally, if I prepare a photon here and detect it there, do picture it as existing and having properties in between. Uh, I don't know what we mean by that word properties. and I, I, I think that's fraught. We could spend a lot of time arguing which properties does it have, which properties doesn't it have, am I asking about the right properties? And right. there I'd run into trouble very quickly. But mm -hmm. I think there is something that exists and that something has properties. Yes. So, so you're willing to commit to the existence of certain properties throughout <laughs> the course of the lifetime of a photon, for instance, so long as you're, you know from the outset what properties you're going to be asking about. I have trouble even interpreting that, that, that question. I think at, at any given time, there is something which has properties. <laughs> which properties are remaining constant and which are changing? That's something that we should discuss. What about polarization? That, that is a property, but I don't describe it, obviously, as a property that has definite value at an arbitrary time. Oh, I thought that's what a property was. <laughs> ah, I see. Okay. So if, if by property we want to say something that has a definite value, mm -hmm. then I'm going to have trouble with photons mm -hmm. because with any system, I'd back up to something like what I said before and say, the only thing I could really call a property is the entire quantum state. And the thing with all of this uncertainty, if you like, built into it. Mm -hmm. And I'll tie myself even deeper in knots when I say, really, 
the only thing of which I'm confident that we can describe the properties in that sense, I even take out the word confident, halfway confident, is the entire universe. Because having alluded to non-locality and entanglement of different systems, well, as soon as I claim we can talk about the properties of this, John will tell me, not if it's entangled with something else. The universe. Right. Now there's a humble man speaking. <laughs> <laughs> it was the royal we. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's quite interesting. <laughs> um, so it seems that as though you're hinting towards what the, the philosophers in the room might look at as being almost a, like a platonic ideal understanding of, of the quantum state. So, so almost looking at the properties of a system as being sort of these projections of, of the literally and also figuratively of, of the more abstract general idea of, of what the state of a system is. Does that, I guess to, to the philosophers in the room, does that sound like an adequate representation of that? I'm, I'm not sure I follow the picture, so, or, or, in what, or at, at least in what regard it's platonic. So, Insofar as there exists some, some perfect thing out there which we call the quantum state, and all that we're able to gain access to are these rough partial images of it. So that sounds a little bit to me like something like an Everettian reading of the theory, um, uh, which, if, like me, what you're fundamentally interested in is not just a, quantum, a theory of quantum mechanics, not just the theory of matter, but also a theory that works on the kind of space-time structure that we think the world actually has that can be understood realistically. Many of these interpretations that have been alluded to, things like Bohmian mechanics and GRW theory, um, which we seem to be able to handle relatively well in the non-relativistic regime, um, no longer function <laughs> particularly well. We don't know how to state those theories completely in the context of a relativistic space-time. The one kind of realistic interpretation that we have where we can make that generalization to uh, uh, relativistic space-times more or less effortlessly is in Everettian, in, is in Everettian quantum mechanics. And I think that's, I, I would never say that I'm a devoted Everettian, but I think that's a serious theoretical virtue that one can't, um, can't take lightly. So that's the kind of thing that might get you in the mood to take seriously some of the more metaphysically extravagant um, aspects of that interpretation of the theory. Right. So for our audience, could you elaborate on what you mean by an Everettian interpretation? So the idea of uh, the, I mean, the basic idea of the Everettian interpretation of quantum mechanics is to take uh, the, the wave function of the whole universe seriously as a, as a, as a description of the world, um, you remove this idea that anything um, in particular happens when we do a measurement. So there's only one kind of temporal evolution in the theory. It's the deterministic evolution of the Schrodinger equation. It's a completely deterministic way of understanding what quantum mechanics is. And rather than um, putting probabilities any, anywhere in um, with uh, uh, by hand, what you do is you try to reread what the theory is describing um, in such a way that it will look to observers um, uh, such that uh, th in the kinds of situations that we believe that we find ourselves in, like we should get the quantum mechanical probabilities. Um, uh, given that, um, what we're doing when we take this super massive superposition of everything in the universe seriously, what we're going to find um, is that in fact, there are many different um, branches of the wave function corresponding to what we typically take to be distinct states of affairs and what the probability assignments on the other interpretations are deciding between being real. On the Everettian interpretation, all of those different branches <laughs> are construed as being equally real. Um, and the project of um, understanding what probability then is on this theory is the hardest problem for this theory, um, but it's a problem of saying, why if I'm on a given branch, why if I'm the copy of myself on, on a given branch, uh, should I believe that I will come to believe that the probabilities are such that as they are distributed by quantum mechanics, which for all of the empirical information we've ever gathered seems to be borne out exactly correctly in the experiments. Right. So it seems, so that's the, the standard many worlds understanding of quantum mechanics. And you, you gave us a a nice reason to perhaps buy into that by saying that it's the only interpretation that we know of 
that very smoothly makes the transition to, to relativistic quantum mechanics. But I, if I had to gamble, I would say that probably no one at this table subscribes to that interpretation. So, so what are the reasons for, for not, uh, aside from the difficulty of assigning probabilities, what are the other main, the, the main baggage that comes how, along? How much are you willing to gamble on that? <laughs> yeah. yeah, how much are you willing to gamble per, Perhaps I'm incorrect. <laughs> no, no, it was a serious question. How much are you willing to gamble <laughs> So I, I can change my point of view for a you know. <laughs> Dutch well, okay, I'll, I'll <laughs> contingently bet. <laughs> no, but so, so realistically, why might we not uh, want to subscribe to that kind of view? Well, uh, so I'll, I'll tell you, it's, I, I'm hesitant to say I'm subscribed to the view or something like that. <laughs> of course. But it's, if I want to understand quantum field theory, the theory under, underwriting the standard model, realistically, in a sense where we're not just talking about our subjective attitudes about the world or like what our predictions might be. But if I want an actual story about what quantum field theory says the contents of the world are when we do scattering experiments, for example, the only way I know how to tell that story um, realistically uh, in quantum field theory is the Everettian way. So when I'm writing expressions in quantum field theory, I use Everett as a guide to understand what I what 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 the ontology might be. It's a, in some satisfactory in the sense that it seems meta metaphysically extremely extravagant. It seems very odd to us that we've got copies of ourselves here um, that we just aren't in causal contact with, contact with because um, we've decohered at some point. Yeah, yeah sorry. Pull the mics closer to your mouth. <laughs> So, so I, I guess the primary reasons that people want, might deny that the Everett interpretation is correct is that it's very hard to recover a meaningful sense of probability, which all of the experiments seem to reveal. And it's a metaphysical picture of the world that's even more extremely at odds than um, some of the other interpretations that we have uh, uh, available to us, at least in the non-relativistic context. Right. Do you mind if I of course. try to amplify that more, more seriously this time? Yeah. So honestly, I'm, I'm very sympathetic to the Everettian view. I also don't ascribe to one view or another. But uh, I used to think that other than this metaphysical baggage you had to accept, there was no downside to it at all. And in recent years, I got to know some people who actually work on the theory. And the way they describe it to me is something I, I think you were trying to point out, which is that there's a rule we use in standard quantum mechanics when you make a measurement, it's called the Born rule. Aaron mentioned Born before. It says you square the wave function that gives you a probability. And to show why that should be the right rule within the Everettian interpretation is the thing that to some people seems to be the stumbling block. How would you prove that? And this is where I, I bring this up because to me it raises a philosophical question where I might just be insufferably naive. And if so, I look forward to being educated which is that the more I hear people talk about this, the more I ask myself, what is our experimental evidence for the Born rule in any case? Because I only get to do one observation one time. The natural response is to say, well, there are times when I do equivalent experiments over and over and over again. I you know, flip 100 quantum mechanical coins and I get about 50 heads, 50 tails. You know, I get 55 and 45, something that fits within the binomial statistics that you would get if you believed Born's rule. But in the end, I've still only done one experiment that involved flipping 100 coins. So how to conclude from that, that we need to believe Born's rule at all and that there is a gap in the Everett interpretation has honestly left me puzzled. Um, if you guys are all right with this, I'd like to shift gears a little bit. Um, so despite all this strange stuff that we've been talking about and all the problems that we have understanding the ontology of quantum mechanics and things of that nature, uh, we still see that it's the one of the most accurate experiment, or sorry, one of the most experimentally precise theories that we've ever proposed. So much so that it's revolutionized how we how we use physics in our uh, in our modern technology. And so I've got a question for Professor Yang, and that is. How did our understanding of technology change when that quantum mechanical revolution occurred? So how did we suddenly switch gears into this quantum understanding of how we can actually use nature, nature's laws uh, to our advantage, I suppose? Um, so I guess your question is our understanding about um, the power and precisions of 
our technology that our technology can mm-hmm. do? Um, um, well, I guess from the technological point of view, it's um, definitely quantum physics opened up a new world for enabling many many different um, new technologies from atomic bomb to semiconductor industry. Um, yeah, so a lot of things that we are using today are in depth to, good or bad, are in depth to that um, theoretical and experimental developments. Um, you mentioned something particular, which is the very high precision, uh, experimental precision that quantum physics was able to achieve, um, especially with respect to this um, quantum field experiments in the 50s. Um, well, to me, it seems that um, these are not qualitative events, but it's just a kind of quantitative extremes of this um, precision science that scientists, especially physics, have been pursuing since the 19th century. So. Um, by the end of the 19th century, even it was before the age of quantum mechanics, there was this high um, expectations of um, like very precise measurements of quantities down to the um, probably 10 to the minus <coughs> tens or 12 decimal points. Um, and you may ask, what was the point of this? Because that was go, that goes totally beyond any... Um, implication for um, application and practicality, uh, that was a kind of um, ethos or scientific ethos or enthusiasm that um, some scientists believe that pursuing precision uh, was sort of the high, very high standards of doing science. And that already existed before the age of quantum mechanics. So quantum mechanics just provided a way to uh, sort of fully flash that kind of ethos in the scientific practice. So that is my understanding historically about this question. Right. Okay, interesting. And then we also see within the last couple of decades that quantum information has really become uh, a massive part of, of modern uh, quantum physics <coughs> research. And it it's of course makes all the headlines with, with things like quantum computers are 10 years away as they have been for the last 20 or so years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so how has the public mindset towards physics changed with the, with the rise of these kinds of uh, ideas in, from quantum information in particular? Well, definitely quantum information uh, raised a lot of hypes and hopes. So, um, yeah, and it created a lot of opportunities for fundings, both within the public sectors and also within the private sector. It was also it has also been seen by um, some um, developing <laughs> but fast catching countries as sort of the lead way for moving into the next technological drive. Like China has been very active in um, developing the uh, the quantum technology. Um, well, I guess there, there has been some progress um, toward the quantum uh, information technology. We have physicists who know more about the developments and progress than I do. Um, well, so in terms of the public understand the public perceptions of, um, of science, whether that has been changed with the um, quantum information technology, um, that's interesting questions. I, I'm not sure about like um, a qualitative change about the public attitude towards science. So this is, um, I would imagine that to the general public, this is just another fancy black box, which a lot of people don't know much about. Uh, and of course, as I said, I think uh, the most consequential curiosity about this is the sort of um, um, incurrence of public and private funding in developed into this new research areas. And we do see some progress along that direction. I, I, I think I, I want to second a lot of what, what you said there, and in particular on the point of the, the public. I'd be really surprised to have anyone tell me that quantum information had a significant impact 
on the public understanding of, of science. You know, the Big Bang Theory had a big impact on the public view of, of physics. And I think that was the last thing. <coughs> There's evidence to this. There are plenty of articles about quantum information. And I talk to lay people who've read those articles and asked me questions. And in the same breath, they will ask me about quantum computers and then say, so what about DNA computing? And the point is those things have nothing to do with one another, except that there are headlines saying your computer is gonna be faster or your IBM stock is gonna be worth more next year. And the only thing the public sees in these articles is something makes your computer faster or makes this company do well. They're not learning anything about quantum information. And it's always been true, and not just you know, since the industrial revolution, but for thousands of years, that science and technology have advanced hand in hand, right? And better measurements and better understanding of the world have let us build more powerful things. And I think most of 20th century technology, what we have, has been part of that. Even if we needed quantum mechanics for it, it was a continuation of that evolution. It didn't require any understanding of what's fundamentally different about quantum mechanics. You know, to build a transistor, okay, you, know, you need to be able to write down these quantum equations. We needed quantum mechanics. You don't need to grasp what it tells us about this new view of reality. Mm -hmm. And what's changed in these last decades is that there are ideas for technological applications, and they happen to be mostly to do with information, mm -hmm. that really make use of what's fundamentally different about quantum mechanics. Mm -hmm. And that certainly has, has breathed new life into things. And uh, John alluded before to the, the fact that people like using this word of, of information, and we don't know whether that brings anything. I think part of what's happened is that we have a theory with very very rocky foundation. And by rocky, what I mean is there are lots of outcroppings. There's no nice, elegant building like there is in relativity, where you take you know, one axiom, another axiom, you reason logically, and everything comes out. Instead, there's a very complicated assemblage of different gears and parts that happen to work when you put them together. And no <coughs> great story of why we should believe that. Why should the world look that way? And that was the situation for the better part of a century. So when people suddenly found all the applications that seem to really make use of the fundamental aspects of the theory have to do with information, some of them started to ask, maybe if we rephrase the axioms in terms of information, something will become clear. And that's a hope, that's not a proof, but that's really the reason for the hope, that there happen to be these information applications. So um, I would like to add a bit more about that, um, which is to, um, to urge us to pay a, um, a bit closer attention to the very, well, today we're talking about quantum weirdness, but I think the very fact about the very historical developments of the fate of quantum information is weird historic, historically, in the, as a case in the history of science, because um, um, as we have discussed, there uh, it seems that there is a consensus among physicists um, about the two very different realms of things. One is the um, the um, sort of the computational part of quantum mechanics, which has to do with um, experimental predictions, the empirical verified uh, phenomenon, and the quantum mechanics has been very successful in producing experimental predictions. But on the other side, there's interpretations of um, quantum mechanics, which many people disagree with, right? So um, it has been taken for granted by many people that um, these two realms of exercise or practice were very different. And if you're down to the earth phys physicists and scientists, you can worry about the calculation part. If you're philosophers, you can worry more about the interpretation part. So at some points, like um, 1950s and 60s, so there's this, well, what historians characterize as shut up and calculate attitudes, uh, which is don't worry about the foundation interpretation issue. Let's just focus on how to calculate the probability, well, sort of like the amplitude uh, intensities of like... Um, the radiations, involved radiations or quantum fields, etc. Um, but then you have, um, so for a while, this quantum interpretation issue has been very quiet in the fields, right? So there are just um, probably less than two dozen people 
worrying about and talking about the quantum inter interpretation of quantum mechanics. And then you had to come back around the 60s and 70s. And then you came with some new ideas like coming from bailed inequality and the exper possibility of experimentally create the EPR state. And then a, a, a lot of this sort of um, questions that belong originally to the interpretation and the <coughs> philosophical part began to gain some not only empirical but also practical grounds and diffuse into the applications, diffuse into the experimental physics. So this is a probably mo most one of the most strange coming back that, um, that I've seen in the history of science in which the purely theoretical or even fundamental or uh, philosophical investigations, which died out for quite a while, ended up having a coming back and become probably one of the most powerful powerhouse for new technologies today. So very weird, very strange. Not only strange in the conceptual level, mm -hmm. but also in the historical level. Excellent. Well, I think that's an excellent place for us to then pause and take a break and then come back and have a Q&A in about five minutes, I suppose.